and a confrontation of champions as they come toward the top of the stretch. And they're into the stretch, and here we go. Songbird set down. Beholder is alongside. The seven-year wait is over. American Pharaoh is finally the one. American Pharaoh has won. He's just perfect, and now he's just immortal. Here's the Hello and welcome to the Capital OTB Stakes Preview for March 2nd. Sully Crowdy and Mike Callahan in here. Mike, how are you? What's up, Sully? Uh, a little bit of a slow weekend last weekend. Not the case this weekend. A lot of action down at Gulfstream Park. Uh, deep fields. We were taking a look at it. Uh, so much to go over, but uh, you can find a lot of value in these races. Yeah, you, you definitely can. And there's so many stakes races on a day like this and a card like this early on. The pick five looks to be... You, know, you should be able to get some prices in there within the stakes races and then later on as well with the big ones later on in the card. But we're going to look at five as we always do at Gulfstream Park. Uh, all five will be at Gulfstream. They have an early post of 11.30 on Saturday. But we'll look at the first one we'll look at is race number seven. That is the, that is the, the very one. Grade three event, uh, mile and three sixteenths on the turf course. And then we'll look at the final four on the card, 11 through 14. Race 11 is the Honey Fox, grade three event, a mile on the turf. And then we'll move on to race number 12. Race number 12 is the uh, Devona Dale, grade two, um, grade two for three-year-old fillies. They're going one mile on the main track. Race number 13 is the highlight. Uh, Kentucky Derby points on the line. This is the Fountain of, uh, Fountain of Youth, a mile and a 16th on the main track for three-year-olds. And then race number 14. Uh, race 14 is a grade 2 event. They're going a mile and 3 eighths. This is for 4 year olds and up and it, it is a deep and very, very competitive field to close out what is a, a very nice card at Gulfstream. Yeah, we will go back, jump into the fun in race number 7 at Gulfstream, which Shelly just told you about. It's a field of 8. You're going to see the field here in a second with the favorite being the 3 at 9 to 5, Holy Helena. Uh, who's going to go out for the hometown connections in Stronic? Jimmy Jerkins trained. Our Ryder Tees Jr. is going to be aboard. Uh, this horse last time raced in the grade three La Provence. Finished sixth that day. I don't think like the yielding surface. Uh, if you take a look, best races have come on firm, firmer type goings. Uh, so for me, that's going to be a throw. You go back to the last race, uh, this, ra this horse raced on firm going, was two back. When I thought should have beat CKS Buena. Uh, that day ended up getting angled out. You're going to see in the line there traffic upper stretch. Uh, that's to say the least because she had a, a, a ton of traffic to get through that day, sort of angled out. The wire came a little too soon for her to get past. But for me, she's a serious contender in here, logically at nine to five on the morning line. I think it's going to be slightly lower than that. I'm going to go on a different angle. We want to see your, your thoughts here on the favorite going into this race. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Holy Helena is the one to be. And as you said, going out for Stronic, I love Jimmy Jerkins and these long route races on the grass. But I, I, I am personally against Holy, not against her, just going to try to beat her in this spot. Um, there's a couple horses in here. I think they give her a run for her money here. Um, and I tried to look for a horse that's going to be forwardly placed in this spot. Holy Helena wants to come off the pace, and she can close from way back or in a stalking role. And there are some horses that will be towards the front. Uh, in this field, but I, I ultimately landed with Mark Henning's runner, the number four in here, who's at seven to two uh, on the morning line and was in that same was in that race uh, last time out against Holy Helena, and I thought ran a really credible race, going a mile and a half, running a fifty and one. That's not fast. It's not slow. It, it's it, usually the, the fractures will be a little slower than that. I think this is the only speed in here with Javier, and Javier uh, really can slow down races on the front end, and I think well, Javier will open his horse up around the far turn and just run away. That's what I'm hoping for. You're getting a nice price at 7-2. to two. Most likely, you'll get a better price than 3.5-1, to one, especially if only Helena goes off around even money. Then you'll get maybe 4-1. to one. Um, But 7-2 to two offers a lot of value for this heading runner. Mark Henning is only 1-25 for 25 at this meet. But he's running the money 11 times in, that, in those 24 starts. And, one, and two of those second and third place finishes were with this horse, losing by two and a half lengths and a length. So uh, I'm going to use this horse on top. Holy Helena underneath, we just talked about her. She's very, very tough in here. But I'm going to try to beat the Jimmy Jerkin runner. If she runs back to her 96, 95 buyers, she's going to be very tough to beat. Running well against Santa Monica and four-star crooks. Sister Charlie, daddy's little darling, all were in um, 
a Breeders' Cup turf race, but the one I have in the third spot, that is Danceland at 6-1 six, six for Shug McGahey and John Velasquez will be aboard. Johnny V is a, 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 and, and Shug win a lot of races together. This is a horse that I think had a brutal trip last time out, was a little wide um, last time out. Two back was very, very wide, was 10 lengths off the lead, had a wide turn with Jose Descano at Aqueduct early, uh, later on in the month of November and ran third that race behind a pretty nice field. Tricky Escape was in that field. Um, the number seven horse, who I'm ultimately going to have fourth, but Tricky Escape's interesting as well in a nine to two price. But I'm going to try to beat Holy Helena uh, in this spot uh, with a horse that's going to be forwardly placed because if you're on the lead with slow fractions at Gulfstream, or anywhere for that matter, it's very tough to catch a horse. Yeah, I, I like all four of the horses that you mentioned, uh, just in a little bit of a different order. Tricky Escape is a horse that I liked a couple weeks ago when we did the stakes preview in that grade three event down at Gulfstream Park. Was coming off a November layoff, but was in such good form going into the fall of 2018. Had uh, ripped off three in a row and uh, really had a nice one against Mom. Mom's on strike down at Kentucky Downs where he sort of fended off the entire field. Uh, she did to get the job done that day, getting a 90 buyer. Again, she was coming off that layoff on January 26. She made a huge middle move, and that was primarily because the horses behind her sort of made their move, and she just didn't want to lose position. I understood what Chris DiCarlo was doing in that situation, but for me, going the distance that they were going a mile and a half, she sort of got a little leg weary down the stretch. Ultimately finished fifth that day, only beating four and a half lengths. I thought that was a decent enough performance to think second off the layoff, going out for John Service, who's good in this spot, 19% second off this type of layoff. And again, you always think of Jason Service, but John Service is just as good. It was 24% in 2018, so 9-2 to two I think is going to offer good value. I think that's going to hold in here because all the money is going to go towards Holy Helena, who I do have in the second spot. And I think the only fault you're going to say with Holy Helena is the price you're going to get. Uh, obviously, she's the class of the field in here uh, and looks to be much uh, the best on paper, but they do have to run the race, and we'll see how it goes. My question to you, because I do have uh, your top selection, uh, Sempere Septime, uh, in the third spot and then dancing in the fourth spot. Who do you think is going to get the lead in this race? Because you're taking a look at Lafta. Mm. You're taking a look at Iki Macho, uh, a couple of these right. that have shown speed before but don't do it every type of race so uh, for me it's going to be interesting to see who gets the lead in here uh, and who sits off the pace in here right. i think that's the key to it and trying to figure it out when you're taking a look at the pps right. is ultimately what you're trying to do i mean i mean julian's really good at getting the lead on the, on the number five laugh the first time in the irons for this one this one is stretching way out to the smile on three sixteenths but if Lafta gets the lead, Javier could sit second and slow down the race from behind Lafta if Lafta runs quick fractions. But if Lafta gets the lead, slows the race down. Leperu is so good at wiring fields on the turf. So I, I don't think it matters if, if Javier gets the, the second spot. As long as Lafta's in front running quick, Javier could slow down behind the horse and then go. That that's It will be interesting to see who gets the lead, but if Javier gets the lead, he will have to slow down because Lafta is going to try to push the pace. He would think stretching out, uh, especially with a good wire-to-wire -wire turf ride in Julian Laparu. Yeah, I think the first couple of furlongs of this race is going to be key. And then, like you said, it becomes a jocks race from there to see who's going to sit where, who's going to be able to slow down the fractions, who's going to be able to make a move, and who's going to be able to make the final move uh, coming down the stretch to be able to make that a winning type. So uh, we'll see what happens there in the very one. Your thoughts again, uh, selections-wise? Four, three, one, and seven. And I had it seven, three, four, and one in the seventh at Gulfstream. A grade three event, the very one. We're going to take a look at the 11th on Saturday. It's the grade three Honey Fox. You're going to have a field of 10 in here. And this is a pretty wide open race as far as the morning line goes. I don't think it's going to be, and pretty much we're alluding to the, the fact that we have the same top horse on top, I think it's going to take a ton of money yeah. uh, at post time, but you're going to see the morning line favorite as the nine. That's Bella uh, Bella Voss, who's three to one on the morning line, going out for Todd Pletcher and Joel Rosario. Horse that's won two of the last three, including that Grade Three event down at Gulfstream. Likes Gulfstream. Horse for the course, two for three. Lifetime down there. Likes the distance, four of eight. I think all the money's going to go towards the one known. That's yeah. Prey Seuss, and we're going to see a replay because Sully and I both like this horse, so we use the same replay. Uh, of the De La Rose last year at Saratoga. Both of the horses, you're going to take a look at the five, but you're also going to take a look at the horse even wider than the five right there, the one, which is Uni. Both those horses are going to be coming very fast, and this was a moderate tempo. So for these horses to be able to close as quickly as they were, they engulfed the front runners, and pretty much it was a match race down uh, to the wire in here. And Uni's able to get the best of Preseus this day. 
Uh, I, I would like to see a rematch of those two horses. Right. I think Presus has enough talent to be able to do it. But you're taking a look at the PPs for Presus. This is a horse that has not raced very often. So that's a little bit of a, uh, a negative factor in here. But when Presus is able to run, she puts in some really big efforts. You go back to the three back where she beat a field of 18 and won a group one in France. You go to the two back race. She finished seventh, but she finished seventh to Winter, Roly Poly, and Hydrangea, who are all three of them are group one winners and only was beaten by six lengths that day. That was the group one coronation at Ascot. I think that was a solid performance considering that all three of those horses that I just mentioned would be one to nine in this type of situation. And then you take a look at the first North American race uh, up at Saratoga, finishing second to Uni. What has Uni done since? Uni's gone on to win two races in a row, including a grade three and a grade one. I think the money is going to show you, if for some reason Presu shows up at five to one on the board at post time, I think yeah. that's probably a huge concern. But if she somehow shows up at eight to five or nine to five in that situation. I think she's ready to go. The workouts say they do. I know you're high on her too. What are your thoughts on her and the rest of the field? I mean, you covered, you covered it pretty well there. And you know, Chad's so good off the layoff and that'd be the one question mark. Will she like a firm turf course? She was on a soft turf course and very wide at Saratoga from that replay. And they were going slow, as you said, 25 into a 15-4. And Uni, as you said, went on to win a deep field at Del Mar, beating Daddy is a legend. Who And Uni went off at 5-1, to one, which was a gift. Beat Basilica, who came back to win again last weekend. So 7-2, to two, if this horse stays at 7-2, to two, that is a gift. I think this horse goes off as a favorite, just like you do. Um, and she, she is the one to beat. Javier had the, you know, the option, most likely, to stay on Todd's horse, and he's been riding well on that horse the last couple of starts. And a winner in the grade three last time out. Uh, lost to Kapla Tem Temptress, the number nine horse, by three lengths. I know you were very high on Kapla Temptress, and, and, she, and she really has done nothing wrong in the career. I had to put her third in my mix, though. I had the one on top. The number six I had in the second spot, Scotty's model at 15-1 to 1 with Julian Leperu. Just because of the pace factor again. We covered him. He's good on the front end in these route races. And the nine's going to get towards the front, but most likely he's going to be sitting off the pace. Scotty's model should get to the lead if, if Joe Bravo does not with Conquest Hard Candy. But Scotty's model runs well from off the pace as well. So I'm just trying to get a little bit of a price in between the two horses who will be short prices. Ultimately, Chad's horse and Todd's horse. I'm trying to split them with a little bit more of, of a speed horse in the number six Scotty's model. And then the 10 horse I had in the fourth spot. At 4-1, four to one, I think it's a nice value for Bill Mott. A horse that ran well last time out. I didn't think it was a, a you know, the horse had some trouble in that race. Um, pretty wide uh, the last two starts. Uh, but it was a really nice effort to get up to win that race uh, for the first start at Gulfstream Park. Came in from the Naira circuit, ran against some nice horses in New York. And then at the distance, this horse is running the money every single time. So price is right for Bill Mott, 4-1. to one. I'm going to use on all my tickets. I'm going to use in the third, fourth spot for a triple. Uh, but for me, I think Chad Brown's going to be tough to beat. 7-2 to two is a gift on the morning line. I don't think we'll get near that. Yeah, I agree with you with the 10. Uh, the two horses I'm primarily going to target in this uh, pick four sequence uh, is Prey Seuss and Dolce Lily. Uh, you take a look at Dolce Lily. That, that race last time I thought was extremely good considering the, the pace of the race. I know it was over yielding going. It's, you're going to see slower times. But really, the, the, the race did not unfold any way uh, in the liking of Dolce Lily. And she was still able to close very strongly, get up to win that race by a half lane. Got a nice 89 buyer. I think can improve off that. And you're going to see Johnny V stick, who's been aboard for the last three or four. So I think he knows this horse really well. Maybe able to get the job done in here at 4-1. to one. And actually, things going to float up as far as the price goes in here. So we'll see if Dolce Lilly can get the job done. And then the four in the third spot, that's La Signore. Like you said, the, the pace of this race is going to be quite interesting. You know La Signore is going to be forwardly placed. Now, the disappointment last time in that grade three event down at Gulfstream leaves you a little bit of a concern. But since then, the workouts have been so strong, you maybe just want to throw a line through that race. And uh, again, going out for Brian Lynch, who does really well down there and does really well everywhere he goes you're going to see jose ortiz get back aboard so i think this is a little bit of a sleeper play at six to one as well i had the nine uh Belavas in the fourth spot again i just think the price and i know i know she's good at Gulfstream park she's two for three uh, as far as lifetime goes and the buyers have been good i just not so sure she's going to get the same type of setup like she did in the last couple uh but and i'm trying to get a little bit better value with some of these horses in here as well uh, but I think Prey Seuss is going to be very, very tough to beat in this spot. So I saw, I saw it 1, 10, 4, and 9. What were your thoughts again? 1, 6, 9, and 10. All right, we'll take a, we'll take a look at one more before we go to our break. We're going to take a look at the Devona Dale 
a grade two race, and there's going to be a standout horse in here, and that's going to be Jay Walk, who is yeah. the reigning Eclipse champion, two-year-old filly last year, uh, had ripped off four in a row, including the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, where she had a dominant performance against some really good horses, including Reckless Rider. She beat Vibrance that day. Uh, also beat a couple nice horses out west as well. And uh, again, a horse coming in off four in a row, uh, going to make the three-year-old's campaign uh, as far as the debut goes here for John Service. And again, she's the one that everybody's going to be targeting in here at two to five. Not much more to say about her. She obviously on paper looks to be very, very tough to beat on paper. Uh, did you think anybody could beat her in this spot? And if so, what were some intriguing horses that you thought? I, I did. I, I tried to beat Jay Walk, and I am going to pull up a replay of my top choice, Champagne Anyone. Uh, Champagne Anyone is the number five horse going off for Ian Wilkes. And much like the earlier race we talked about, there's a ton of speed in this paper, and Champagne Anyone is the number one horse, and you'll see flying late. This race was seven furlongs, so um, I think this horse will appreciate a little bit of a stretch out, and there's a lot of speed in this race. If anyone can handle a fast pace, we know it's Jaywalk because the horse went 46-3 and three in the Breeders' Cup, but as you can see, the number one horse is making up a lot of ground late in this race, so I think the stretch out from seven to a mile is just going to help out this runner for Ian Wilkes. You get Chris Landeros aboard as well. Uh, Chris Landeros has had a really nice meet, and he's ran huge on these big stakes cards, and we saw that... Uh, we saw that all meet long on these weekends at Gulfstream when there's big stakes, big cards. Chris Landeros usually runs big races. Um, this is a horse that ran well, as you saw from that replay last time out. Ran well in an optional claimer at Keeneland, going the mile distance. 48-1 at Keeneland, I mean, that's tough to, to get a horse, especially when you're nine lengths off the lead and then seven, and the horse got up to win by a nose that day, beating Oxy Lady, who's a nice horse, and she's done, done to, gone on to do some nice things, but I think there's a lot of speed in here, and we know Jay Wan can handle the pace. Handle a 45-3 and three at Belmont, handle a 46-3 and three at Churchill. Off the layoff, I'm personally going to try to beat the horse, but I could see why some people would single jaywalk because the rest of the sequence can be a little di a little difficult. But I had champion anyone on top, jaywalk in the second spot, and then the third spot I went with the seven high regard. Another horse with some closing speed, so I'm going to go with two closing speed horses. This horse lost to Mother Mother by um, uh, four lengths. Mother Mother is a really nice horse out west. So I I'm going to see if Javier can maybe pick up the pieces late from the outside stall. Uh, but again, Jay Walk definitely the one to beat with Joel Rosario in yeah. town. I'm not so sure you can beat Jay Walk. Possibly with I, I do like the five. I have the five in the mix. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a sleeper horse in here. That's gonna be Bold Script, and we're gonna see the replay of Bold Script's last race uh, against Ontario Breds up at Woodbine on November 4th. This to me was a really nice performance. I know it's the synthetic. Just took the lead here and is gonna open up. They went moderate fractions early, but she really came home late. And for me, the way the race shapes up, Jay Walk's going to go to the lead. You're going to see a couple other in here go with her. I think Bold Script's not going to be too far off. And if she's able to transfer that synthetic <laughs> form onto the dirt, the workouts have been superb down there. And Stuart Simon, who's going to bring this horse down from Woodbine, he knows what he's, he's doing. He usually brings his good horses here. He has three starts so far at Gulfstream with a couple runner-up finishes. And again, at 12-1 to 1 on the morning line, I think if you have Jay Walk, and you know, 12 to 1, maybe this horse goes up at 20 to 1 with the inflated odds. Maybe you get a $15, $20 exact with Jaywalk and Bold Script, who might be able to run 1 2 in there. And then in the third spot, uh, Champagne, anyone. Like you said, if you're just trying to beat, I think the 5 is probably the most logical horse in here. I didn't have the 7 in my mix for Javier and uh, uh, Victoria Oliver, but for me, I thought Champagne, anyone is, is probably the most solid of the closures in here. Uh, and one to you is going out for Ian Wilkes. So, again, for me, I saw it 1, 6, and 5. Your thoughts? I have 5, 1, 7, and 6. All right, that's going to bring us to our break. When we come back, we'll take a look at the last two, including the big one, the grade 2 Fountain of Youth. It may be cold in the Northeast, but in South Florida, the action's hot. This winter, be part of the championship meet at Gulfstream Park, where the fields are deep and the payouts are big. With some of the most competitive turf racing in America, Gulfstream Park is your winter destination for the finest in championship thoroughbred horse racing. And if you're looking for the top jockeys and best trainers, you'll find them all at Gulfstream Park. So play it today. Gulfstream Park. Champions start here. Here in upstate New York, no one provides bettors with more wagering options than Capital OTB. Our network of ranch and easy bet locations stretches from the mid-Hudson Valley all the way to the Canadian border and west to central New York. So whether you need to place a bet 
fund your capital bets account, or watch the next big race, all the action is just around the corner. A full list of our branch and easy bet locations can be found online at CapitalOTB.com. Capital OTB, the better and most convenient choice for wagering in upstate New York. No matter where in the world you are, the excitement of wagering on horse racing is just a click away. You'll get live streaming, past performances, race replays, our virtual tote board, analysis and selections from professional handicappers, a simple, safe, and secure wagering platform, and best of all, you get track prices. CapitalOTBBet.com. Bet any place, anytime at CapitalOTBBet.com. And be sure to download our new mobile app from the iTunes Store or Google Play. Welcome back to the Capital TV Stakes Preview. Mike Callahan, Sully Crotty. We were halfway through the show, went over the first three. We're on to our last two, and we're going to start off with the big one on Saturday. Again, a full card of 14, 1130 post. All our branches are going to open up at 11 o'clock, so note that. Take advantage of that all day. Uh, but again, the Fountain of Youth Grade 2 event, mile and a 16th. You're going to see a field of 11 pop up here on the screen here in a second. And you're going to see the favorite in here. And everybody's, this is the, this is the noisemaker in here. Uh, Hidden <laughs> Scroll, who we got a chance to see. And you got a chance to see in person, person yeah, crazy. <laughs> down there uh, going out for Judd Mott. Joel Rosario is going to be aboard. was 8-1 to one that day. I really hope that some people mm -hmm. scored in the easiest way possible on Hidden Score. Uh, but we're going to see the replay of that because I know you wanted to show it. Uh, but got a 104 buyer. There are a few maiden special weight victories that are going to be like this. But when you see the replay, you're going to see why, how that source was geared down. Unbelievable performance. Yeah, it, it really was. And before I, I say why I'm going to try to beat the horse, I, this replay really is, speaks for itself. Joel's not even riding the horse. Um, and every, this was a really nice maiden special weight race as well. Todd had a couple, I believe, and I think Chad had Look at had those one. fractions. Just and look at those fractions. It, it, those, right. those, I mean, those are seasoned veteran fractions. And you are completely geared down Wrapped into up, 134. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, like you said, there, there are question marks. And I don't have hidden scroll on top. It's going to need to prove it again. Uh, right. But I want to let you finish your thoughts. But it's just unbelievable performance. And, and you know, I... Before I, I say who I like and why, Hidden Scroll that day, I don't want to knock the horse at all. That whole Pegasus day was rail and speed favored the entire day. And we saw that the entire card, if you were on the rail and you had speed, you won. And that's what happened with Hidden Scroll. And it's not like Hidden Scroll ran up the rail and won. That was a dominating main special weight break right there. Hidden Scroll, you know, I'm just really excited to see how the horse runs going two turns speed has won this race the last two races promises fulfilled was the only speed in the race last year and won but there was a lot of speed on paper in this race so i think the fractions will be quick again i'm excited to see how hidden scroll does going two turns there's obviously a whole nother gear to this horse as we saw from wrapped up it, the horse was wrapped up there i like the number four bourbon war in here at 10 to 1 and the first three three races here i've been trying to beat the favorite i'm gonna to try to beat the favorite again bourbon war has a nice closing kick and you know i've been going with the opposite of trends if there's a lot of speed i'm picking a closer but and if there's a lot of closers i went with the speed that's just how the i've been picking in this um stakes preview today but bourbon war has a really nice closing kick we saw this horse at the remsen lost the maximum mischief who's now off to Kentucky Derby Show from an injury. Ran decent in the Holy Bowl, went really quick. Harvey Walbanger went up the rail to win the Holy Bowl. But in the Remsen, I didn't think it was a bad performance at all. But in the first of December at Aqueduct, going a 50 and 3, it it's tough to make up those fractions, especially the cold weather, um, the drier track at Aqueduct. So I, I, I gave a pass to Bourbon War there. Came back the next time out at Gulfstream, went the mile on the 16th. Closing speed, uh, 47-2. and two. I think he'll get the same kind of fraction here and was able to win that race by two. So uh, really nice ride by Irad last time out to win that race for Mark Henning. I, I like the closing speed here. I think the fractions will be quick. And the one thing I like, this horse is one for one at Gulfstream at the distance in a nine-horse field. So 10-1, uh, to one, very appealing with the leading jockey at the meet on top. Hidden scroll in the second spot. I already talked about this horse. Obviously, very excited to see how this horse runs again. And then the number eight horse, Global Campaign at 10 to 1 I'm going to use underneath 2 for 2 lifetime a horse that stretched out from sprint to an optional claimer last time out Louis Sias in the irons Winstar farm bred horse $250,000 purchase out of Curlin wired the field last time pretty impressively as the favorite so I think you're getting a 10 to 1 price if I think Louis is going to try to play a little catch him if you can here or 
force the, the, the pace to be a little quicker with hidden, uh, hidden scroll on top. So uh, I think the race sets up for a closer in here. I went with a little bit of a shot at 10 to 1. I went 4, 7, 8, and 5. I went 5, 7, 4, and 1. And we're going to see the replay of Acoma. Who's going to go out for George Weaver, and you're going to see Manny Franco got on for the day. You're going to see first time Lasik said, "Well, Vacoma's going to be on the outside here, and is actually going to get the best of Call Paul, who's the six uh, and in between horses right now." You're going to see network effect on the outside, uh, sort of making a little bit of a move, but it gets a little bit uh, leg weary down the stretch. Now, Call Paul, who finished his third in this race, came back to win the Grade Three Swale very convincingly. Vacoma is a May full, so what does that mean essentially? means he's still learning. He's a little bit uh, greener than a couple. And you're going to see that down the stretch like you just saw right there. Didn't switch leads very well. They gave this horse a little bit of a time off since the, the Nashville. They thought they were going to go in the Remsen. Then they just said, you know what, I think we're just going to let him uh, put on some weight, get, get under his feet, sort of get a little bit more polished. And ever since then, his workouts have been tremendous. I know the owner had an article that I read the other day and said he doesn't think he could be, be beat at a mile and 16th. So... Uh, I think this is a very nice three-year-old. George Weaver's in an interesting spot. You, you know, I think he has a horse that he's he's hoping is as good as, as he's seeing in the in the mornings. And, and and again, one of those situations where you take a look at the buyers, the first two buyers, 87 and 97. Besides hit and scroll, this is definitely the second best uh, horse on paper if you're going by buyers. I think this horse can improve. Actually, was working with Breaking Lucky the other day and got the best of Breaking Lucky, who's a really nice older horse as well. For me, it's all of a coma in here at 7-2. I'm hoping that's going to hold. I think everybody with the eye-popping performance of Hidden Scroll, we may actually be able to get that 7-2 to price. So uh, the 5 on top for me, the 7 in the second spot. Hidden Scroll, I, my two big question marks, the two turns that you touched upon, and also the fact that this race is going to be a lot faster with some horses that I think are going to have sustainable speed. You know, we saw a Hidden Scroll on the debut, uh, sort of rushed to the lead, went with a horse that backed up quickly. I think you're going to see this horse go out, and the, and the race dynamics aren't going to be as nice as they were in that meeting especially. And obviously the acid test, you're facing much better quality horses in here. Not that I don't think the horse can win, I just think the value is going to be a little bit too short for me to put on top. Uh, probably goes off somewhere around 6-5, to five, so I'll put that horse in the second spot. And then Bourbon War, which is going to be your top choice. I think you're right. Of all the closures in here that are going to be coming from the way back, I think Bourbon War is going to be the one that you want in here. 10 to 1, I think that might hold as well, going out for Mark Henning. A little bit of cold so far as a trainer stat, 120, 1 for 25, uh, but has been in the money 11 of 25. So for me, uh, I saw it very similar to how you saw it. Uh, and then Code of Honor. What do you do with Code right. of Honor? I was, I was just going to ask you that. Yeah, I, what I do you do with Code of Honor? I, I mean, Signal Man. I, exactly. I threw out Signal well. Man. I know he's been training well for Ken McPeak. And yeah. I know. Uh, uh, Seth was talking about having him on this weekend, so maybe we'll see uh, how Signal Man's doing. I ultimately had to pass. I know the win last time uh, down at Churchill Downs over the stop yeah. was a very good performance, yep. but to me, I didn't think was the best of the closures in here, so ultimately I had to take a pass right. on. Not that I don't think the horse can win. You're going to see this horse take a lot of money at 9-2 to on the morning line. And Court of Honor, Court of Honor was a huge bus horse going into yeah. the fall, uh, then ended up getting stretched out on the Breeders' Cup Juvenile uh, on Breeders' Cup Day, and then ever since then had that subpar fourth place finish in the Mucho Macho Man, and then sort of got off of, uh, of people's radar. So this horse could definitely rebound and put in a serious effort at six to one. So there are a lot of different angles you could yeah. go in this race. Ultimately, I went five, seven, four, and one. Your thoughts again? I went four, seven, eight, and five. All right, we'll take a look at the last one. It's going to be race four of four in that late pick four, race number 14. You're going to see a field of 11 in here. You're going to see the morning line favorite with Channel Maker, the number 11, at nine to five on the morning line. You'll see that there in a second. A horse that just has a substantial class edge over these fields. Yeah. Going out for Bill Mott, Joel Rosario. I know the fifth place performance in that Pegasus turf last time doesn't look good, but that was against, obviously, the world's best in that type of situation. Bricks and Mortar, who may be in a league... Uh, of, of his own right now. And then you have Magic Wand, who is the nice filly from overseas. Delta Prince, who put in a nice performance as well. But you go back to any of those 100-plus buyer races, and there are four in a row that would absolutely demolish anybody as far as buyers goes in here. Uh, deserve it, favorite in the spot. I'm going to try to beat, but what were your thoughts on Channel Maker? Yeah, I, I mean, Channel Maker is the one to be in. The one thing I was looking at with this race, I'm only going too deep in pick fives in here. I'm going to use Channel Maker and my top choice is six Zulu Alpha. Um, but the thing about Channel Maker is this horse ran great against uh, Glorious Empire twice at Saratoga. Glorious Empire earlier in the meet 
wired the field very, very convincingly at Gulfstream, um, and was able to run down that horse twice at Saratoga. Uh, did win at Belmont as well on the front end. No one else really wanted to get to the lead. So this horse beat Roberts Bruce, beat uh, Sadler's Joy. So, and again, no shame losing to Nabel and Bricks and Mortar at all. So this is a horse that ran down a horse that really looked very impressive over this turf course in Glorious Empire. So I think it's deserving 9-5. to five. Uh, The number six horse I have on top, though, is Zulu Alpha. Uh, this is a horse that does have a nice closing kick. And the only reason, I, I think Channel Maker will be a little bit farther back in this spot from the outside post. I don't think Joel is going to have that big of a rush to get to the front end uh, in this spot, especially with the turn coming so quickly. I think he's just going to try to find a spot mid-pack. Um, but Zulu Alpha should break well and sit in a better, a little bit better of a stalking role. And this horse really does have a nice closing kick from sitting in a stalking role. And we saw that last time out in the grade three event over a yielding turf course at golf, at Gulfstream going a mile and a half. Being a nice horse and hunting horn that day. Hunting horn, obviously, we remember that horse uh, from Belmont and Stars and Stripes weekend in the Aiden O'Brien barn. Really nice performance to win that race. Went off as the favorite uh, at a little bit over a two to one. So I like the three to one price. I like where this horse is going to be placed. And Mike Maker on the turf is always dangerous. Channel Maker we already talked about. I have in the second spot. Obviously, I, it's going to be tough to beat this horse. The horse to beat in this spot. But the four I thought was interesting is Hunter O'Reilly. A horse going out for Jimmy Toner. Tyler Gaffleone's going to be aboard. A horse that wants nothing to do with the pace at all. Um, and has a serious closing kick. We saw that in the Sword Dancer. Was able to run fourth that day behind Sadler Shoy and Money, Money Multiplier. Ran well. I thought uh, against one go all go even though it doesn't look great the ninth place finish there I thought the Elkhorn the horse really this wasn't the horse's day but came back uh, at Gulfstream on a yielding turf course on Pegasus weekend I thought ran a nice race ran a nice fourth um, in, in a course that was really hard to close in besides bricks and mortar so um, for me I think it's gonna be tough to beat channel maker but I'm gonna take a little bit of a shot at the second choice at three to one you set me up so well my top <laughs> choice Hunter O'Reilly 4, 11, 6, and 2 for me. Like you said, I, I, I agree with all the points. I have Zulu Alpha right in the mix, a horse that's won three of the last four. Very impressive last time over a yielding surface down at Gulfstream. Channel Maker, decisive edge as far as uh, uh, you know the grade one races that this horse is raced in. Uh, and the buyers are just enormous when you're taking a look at the field. I think the class relief is going to help in this type of situation. The price is going to be real short. Uh, and the outside post, a little bit tricky for me going the mile and three eighths, but we'll see how that works out. But for me, you're going to see a replay of Hunter O'Reilly, a horse that was coming off of a long layoff. And I've been seeing uh, since April of 2018, reappeared at January 26th on Pegasus Day. Is going to be fanned extremely wide. Is actually the widest horse right now, the number nine coming down the stretch. It's ultimately going to finish fourth in here, but I thought finished up with very good energy. Again, it had to go the widest of all the horses in here. And I think could have finished third easily in this type of situation. The front two were Zulu, Alpha, and also Soglo. Uh, but I thought this was an encouraging return to the races. You're going to see Tyler Gaffleone get aboard for this horse. Jimmy Toner does really well in this spot. Second off this type of layoff is actually 33%. So uh, for me, if you're looking for a little bit of a price play in here, I think 10 to 1 is going to offer extremely good value. And I think this horse is going to get a decent setup in here as far as pace scenario goes in here. Going to my own three ace is ideal. Already has the, the, the victory in that sword dancer as well. So for me, I think this horse may be able to do it second off the layoff. I'll try it at the 10 to 1 odds underneath the 11 and the 6, which you already touched upon. And then Village King in the fourth spot. Another one I think is a value play. I like this horse last time in that grade 3. Uh, W.L. McKnight race down at Gulfstream Park. Zula Alpha won that race. Ended up finishing 7th that day. But they sent honest enough fractions. This horse was forwardly placed. Had to make a huge middle move. I think with a better trip in here, I think Village King is one to use in here at a little bit of price too. For some reason, Zula Alpha doesn't run. Uh, and Channel Maker don't run their races. I think those two, Hunter O'Reilly and uh, Village King, could absolutely put in performances that could win this. So for me, it's going to be 4, 11, 6, and 2. Yeah, I, I, I went 6, 11, 4, and 8. All right, those, that's our thoughts on this upcoming weekend. Again, a huge weekend down at Gulfstream Park. Do want to thank them for their sponsorship. They are going to be the sponsor of this show because yeah. it's all Gulfstream Park races. Gulfstream Park champions start here. Do want to thank them for a lot of contests that we run here and content that we provide, including the stakes preview uh, on this weekend's agenda. Uh, also, anything else to add going into the weekend? It's a phenomenal card. Again, early post of 11.30 and, and a lot of chances to make money here. I think you could beat a couple favorites on the early part of the card and as you, as we think, you could beat a couple favorites later on in the card. Absolutely. We just walked you through that late pick four. So again, uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Take care. You're watching OTB TV.
a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.